to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Vicki Caspi. I'm a professor of physics here at McGill University and director of the uh, McGill Space Institute. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce another Vicki K, uh, astrophysicist, uh, uh, here for the uh, public Astro McGill Night. Uh, so Vicki Calagera is uh, the E. O. Haven Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University. She's also the co-founder and director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics, Sierra, which is, uh, the more we talk, the more we understand uh, that Sierra is very similar to the McGill Space Institute, which is uh, very exciting for us. Uh, Vicky got her bachelor's degree at the University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Did I say it? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and uh, was a uh, Center for Astrophysics and Clay Postdoctoral Fellow at Harvard University. Uh, Vicky is a theorist uh, who works on understanding electromagnetic emission and anticipated gravitational waves uh, from astrophysical systems and she is a member of the LIGO collaboration uh, and is helping to develop the optimal methods for uh, a detection of gravitational waves uh, and to interpret the, the signals that LIGO detects um, uh, uh, for astrophysical uh, models. And she is the recipient of many research prizes, so I'm just going to name a few. In, actually, this year, in 2016, she received the Hans Bethe Prize from the American Physical Society. Uh, she's also won the David and Lucille Packard Foundation Fellowship in Science and Engineering the Maria Gopert Meyer Award from the American Physical Society, uh, the Annie Jump Cannon Award from the American Astronomical Society, uh, and has a fellowship in uh, theoretical physics from the Simons Foundation. Uh, and as a member of the discovery team for the first LIGO source, uh, she is included in the 2016 Gruber Prize in Cosmology and the 2016 Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Uh, so it is uh, really a thrill to have her here, and I'm going to just tell you one uh, story. So with two Vicky Ks uh, in astrophysics, you, some people ask, well, do people ever get you confused? Uh, and in fact, the answer is yes. And uh, recently, uh, uh, I had the occasion, uh, uh, there was an interesting result. I won a prize, and there was a lot of press about it, and I got a call from a reporter in Athens asking me for an interview. And I said, oh, you're in Athens, really? And they said, yes, uh, we understand that uh, you won a prize, and uh, uh, I got your name from the Greek consulate website. <laughs> and so I went to the Greek consulate, the famous Greek astronomer wins prize in Canada. And I had to explain, <laughs> oh, again, it confused me with a different Vicky K, and uh, although I love Greece and all that, it's wonderful that I'm not Greek. Uh, but anyway, let me introduce to you the Greek Vicky K, uh, <laughs> Vicky Calagera from Northwestern University. Thank you, other Vicky K. <laughs> As as we always sometimes, I think I refer to you sometimes this way, and probably you do the same when we're not in our, uh, together at the conference. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction, and everybody, thank you for being here. Yes, I am originally Greek. You can tell from this subtle accent I have. Um, I've lived more than half of my life in the US, but the accent will never go since I moved as an adult. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to get to talk to you about this uh, uh, really uh, thrilling experience. Uh, we, uh, the members of the LIGO and Virgo collaborations, um, experienced this past year, almost just about a year ago, uh, the, the lives of about a thousand scientists and engineers in the LIGO-Virgo collaborations actually changed dramatically and forever. Uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled to tell you about it because it's also, I hope by the end of the talk you will realize why we're all so excited about. Uh, and maybe uh, you'll understand the reason for why you probably all heard something a few months ago 
on TV, newspapers, or other press. <clears throat> and what happened about just a, uh, a year ago, uh, one day, uh, without us expecting much, uh, a signal arrived on two detectors, the LIGO detectors, uh, laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. These are the two detectors, one in Louisiana State and one uh, at Washington State. And a signal arrived that it looked this way. It was very loud. You'll see one, you say loud. Uh, and very characteristic of something we had predicted for a long time, many others had predicted for a long time, but we had never detected before. What we saw was a gravitational wave chirp, uh, chirp like in what birds produce. Uh, and a chirp signal in general is a signal that has a strength, an amplitude that increases with time, and also an oscillation frequency that increases with time. So another way to look at this is in the bottom plot. I don't want to turn my back to anybody, but I do like to point. Let me see if I can use my... Uh, mouse, excellent. Okay. Um, so if you look at this plot, it's a plot of frequency as a function of time. So you can see that this signal arrived, and as the wiggles become closer and closer to one another, the amplitude also is increasing. And in this representation here from the two detectors, red and blue, you see that the frequency is going up very rapidly. And also the brightness of that banana is increasing and that's the amplitude, the strength of the signal. Now it turns out that the frequency associated with these gravitational waves falls right in the regime of the frequency that, uh, of sound waves that our ear can detect. It's a few hundred hertz, 400 hertz is the A node. Um, and we can take the gravitational waves and convert them to sound waves. They're not sound waves by themselves. We're not recording sounds on the LIGO detectors, but um, we can convert them into sound and get a glimpse of how this signal would actually sound. And here's where we got that day. Now you hear two versions of the same signal. The first one is the real signal, straight out of the gravitational wave translation. And you hear noise, and then whoop, whoop, and that's the signal we're talking about. That's the chirp. The, in the second version, we increase artificially the frequency, so it's actually better for our ear and our ear sensitivity. So it turns out that this chirp came from a, now we know, from a pair of black holes, and this is what I'd like to tell you about today. And so they discovered the signal came on September 14. I'll tell you a little bit more about what happened that day uh, later in the talk. But it took us many months for us to get convinced that this signal is real in the sense that it's not terrestrial and it's not coming from our own instruments and that it is indeed astrophysical. So it took a lot of work from a lot of people, checking a gazillion of different things, tons of crazy ideas of what this might be. Let's make sure we're certain it's astrophysical. And so it took us several months, and it turns out that on February 11, uh, 2016, we, about 25, 30 of us, were asked to go to the National Press Club for an event, an event announcing uh, the first uh, detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO detectors. And I'll tell you here, before I play the video, the guy on the podium is Dave Wright. He's our director of the LIGO laboratory. He's also a Northwestern alum. Um, the lady here is the director of the National Science Foundation that funded almost all of the uh, funds uh, necessary for this uh, work to be done. Uh, the lady in white, Gabby Gonzalez, is our spokesperson for the whole collaboration. And there on the right, uh, or my right, and your right, um, it's Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne. Some of you may have heard her, their names. Uh, you may hear their names next week when the Physics Nobel Prize is announced on Tuesday, but maybe not, maybe next year. Um, <laughs> And those are really the fathers of our field, and I'll come back and mention them once more. They are now emeriti faculty. And the four of them were on the stage 
to make the following announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. Now, I was somewhere here on the side of the screen, uh, along with a few more of our colleagues. The room was packed with reporters across the whole world. We call this moment the mic drop moment for our library. We love it. <clears throat> OK, now, what I said we now understand the signal came from is actually a pair of black holes that were swirling one around the other moving closer and closer to one another, emitting these gravitational waves. And as they're coming closer and closer to one another, these two black holes, the signal that you can see down here increases in amplitude, becomes stronger, and the frequency becomes higher and higher, until the two black holes come so close together that they're actually colliding and merging into one bigger black hole. And the signature of this event is the gravitational wave signal. Um, so it took quite a bit of analysis to reach that conclusion. But the data uh, that came from the two directors are shown here again. And through the analysis of the signal, we realized a few things. So first of all, the signal and the progression within the uncertainties of the experiment, the progression of the signal is actually in excellent agreement with Einstein's prediction for how gravitational waves should be emitted by a pair of compact objects uh, going one around the other, uh, um, a prediction that he made a century ago. So uh, 1916 was the uh, uh, publication talking about gravitational waves for the first time. <clears throat> this particular collision of the two black holes, we can, by analyzing the data, we can measure that it happened more than a billion years ago. Okay. Think about this, more than a billion years ago. This is well before microbial life existed on the Earth or anything else that we might recognize today. Um, and the waves traveled for over a billion years and reached us on September 14. When the two black holes came together, they released an enormous amount of energy. Most of this energy, we actually cannot detect it with our detectors. We get only a minuscule amount in our, uh, to interact with our detectors. But if you calculate the full energy coming out from the black hole collision, you can find that it is 50 times brighter than all the stars in the whole universe, in all the galaxies, for that split second of the final collision. The energy released was actually 3 million times the energy one might need to completely destroy our sun. Uh, if you pump that ener energy inside the sun, you would destroy our whole uh, closest star. Now, when the two black holes came together, they didn't destroy themselves. They actually grew. They became a bigger black hole, except now it's signal, and there is no more motion, so you get no more gravitational waves. This final black hole is only about 300 kilometers across. And if I understand correctly from my... Uh, my guild friends, this is about twice the distance between here and Quebec City. Um, and in the final split seconds of the motion, the two black holes were actually the fastest moving objects that we have observed so far. They reached velocities of half a billion kilometers per hour. Don't let your teenagers or you teenagers out there, don't drive this way. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned our collaboration. We are, I'm not exaggerating, we are a thousand scientists and engineers uh, coming all, spread all around the world from uh, all five continents, well, four continents. Um, uh, more than 50 institutions. Northwestern is somewhere here, and Canadian uh, Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics is here as well. <clears throat> so we all work together perfectly harmoniously. Uh, to reach this amazing uh, discovery. Well, after February 11th, uh, we, most of us um, uh, entered the world we're not used to. Uh, so we had tons of interviews, phone calls. Um, I and, and many of my colleagues did live TV interviews in a studio. It's, just, it's a bizarre thing. Um, and uh, I, got a, I got a phone call from the president of Greece. 
um, I was hoping he maybe he would donate a little island to me, but he just said congratulations. <laughs> uh, in any case, it was an amazing time for several weeks. Um, and some of the most unexpected things that happened is that we actually became a conversation piece in everyday life and pop culture. So just about, I think it was 10 days or so on Facebook, people started posting this photograph that was found in trains in, in the New York City subway, okay? So obviously gravitational wave discovery is much easier compared to other everyday things. Uh, a fashion designer has designed a dress that uh, uh, shows our signal um, and uh, we just love it. Uh, probably most of the customers are LIGO collaboration members. Um, and then people have baked all kinds of goods. Uh, here's an example with Einstein's face telling us, you nailed it. At least we imagine so. <clears throat> the New Yorker made the connection to the bird shirts. So that was a cartoon that appeared, I think, a week after the announcement of the discovery. So this was, as I said, this was all amazing. But you may already be wondering, you know, why is this such a big deal? Astronomy has made the news many times. Uh, there's tons of discoveries that are of interest to you. We love talking about them. But this became somewhat even more unusual than what we might have experienced in the past. So I'll take a few minutes now to try and translate, you know, transfer to you why this is such a big deal in astronomy, in physics, might I dare, you know, in science broadly, might I dare say. So for me to explain this, I'll have to go back to the beginnings, the beginnings of astronomy. And I'm sure you have nothing else to do for the rest of the evening, right? And you're serving food for us, right? <laughs> Okay, so we'll go back to the astronomy beginnings. I have a quiz for you. What was the very first telescope we had? That's a good guess, but it's not the right answer. No? I'm sorry, what was your answer? Yes, exactly. But, but, but I, I remain with the same. Any other guesses? Our eyes. Who said that? Thank you. So, the first telescope was actually our eyes. Our eyes is the detector. They detect light. We can look at the sky, forms images like a detector, and we can understand and try and study the universe. And people did this for many centuries. But the beginnings of modern astronomy, as you already said, was around 1600 when Galileo actually took a telescope that was built by the Dutch um, and pointed it towards the sky and started studying the cosmos. Now, since 1600, three centuries uh, passed and we developed astronomy as a real science. Uh, but over the last century, we've had cosmic exploration advanced through the use of many different types of telescopes. Telescopes that are now placed at the tops of the highest mountains, telescopes that are built on valleys of mountains, radio telescopes that Vicky Caspi and other people at um, McGill Space Institute are using, space telescopes in optical, x-rays, and many other wavelengths. Now, electromagnetic waves, you may have heard, are oscillations of magnetic and uh, electric fields, and the oscillations are happening at right angle uh, and perpendicular to the propagation uh, direction. All of astronomy up until now, almost all, has been based on electromagnetic waves. Sometimes we detect particles. Um, and of course, we don't only detect electromagnetic waves that are highly sensitive to the visible, but over the last century, we've covered and we've used many different other waves in everyday life, but also to study the cosmos. So radio waves, uh, microwaves, down to ultraviolet, uh, X-rays, and gamma rays. And you know a lot of these applications that in many ways are connected to astronomy and technology developed for astronomy. So, as I said, over the last century, this was amazing developments we had. We started with the visible in 1609, and radio came in 1932, 
gamma rays in 1961, and then boom, 61, 62, 65. The 60s was an amazing decade yeah. in astronomy. Um, infrared uh, astronomy uh, got started in 1977. What we needed every time was the right detector. Okay, And every time we got the right detector and the right technology, we were able to observe the universe in these different wavelengths, but all are electromagnetic waves. And we discovered things we anticipated, but also things we never anticipated. But this, a year ago, we started a new field of astronomy. We started the field of gravitational wave astronomy. We detected with the right new detectors uh, gravitational waves for the first time, and we detected for the first time binary black holes that we understand are forming from stars. <clears throat> so a few minutes now on what are gravitational waves. And for that, I told you already, gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein. Uh, and it's a, so we need to go back to his time. It's another kind of waves in nature that has nothing to do with electric and magnetic fields. So Einstein predicted these waves in the context of his theory of general relativity, which he developed and published in 1915, and a year later realized that in the context of this theory that describes gravity in nature, gravitational waves exist, might exist, or at least exist in the equations, um, and could be potentially produced. <clears throat> so to get to, to, again, I'm going back to the beginning since we have no time limit. Uh, so I'll tell you in a few minutes about general relativity. It was clearly at the time and still remains a radical idea for trying to understand how gravity works uh, in nature. So uh, Einstein's idea was actually that mass and gravitational force are connected through the geometry of space. So if you have masses in space, the presence of the mass is deforming the geometry of our space-time, but let's think about space is easier. So distances between reference points change because mass is present. So you get these dimples in space-time, you get these disturbances that are very small for us to experience directly. But if these masses are actually moving and accelerating, then the disturbances start propagating as waves in space-time. And these disturbances in space-time is actually gravitational waves. They, too, travel at the speed of light, just like electromagnetic waves, and they carry energy away from their source. Just like when our sun produces electromagnetic waves that are reaching us, the sun is losing energy from its surface. Gravitational waves carry energy as well. <clears throat> so you should think of gravitational waves as disturbances, periodic oscillatory disturbances of our geometry around us because of the presence of accelerating masses. So before LIGO came, one might ask, do we, did we really know gravitational waves exist? Because a theoretical prediction, a mathematical prediction like the one Einstein did in 1916, does not always, in, we know in our history, does not always relate to actual, actually what happens in nature. But it turns out that for six, almost 60 years after his prediction, we had no evidence from anything in nature or in observations that gravitational waves might exist. Until 1974, when these two guys, House Taylor, House, a uh, graduate student, and Joe Taylor, uh, his advisor, in 74, detected a very special system that emits radio waves, regular electromagnetic waves, but those radio waves were being affected by the motion of their source in an orbit, and we could tell that the orbit of these two systems was losing energy. We measured how much energy was being lost over more than 10 years, now over 40 years. And we could tell that the amount of energy and the rate of energy loss was exactly consistent with what Einstein predicted should be lost into gravitational waves. 
So uh, uh, Joe, by the way, was Vicky Gassi's um, uh, uh, PhD advisor in 1993. The two of them received the Nobel Prize for this discovery and the implications of this discovery for providing the very first evidence that gravitational waves existed. But the evidence came from radio wave observations. We couldn't actually detect the gravitational waves themselves, and we couldn't use them as an astronomical tool to study the universe. <clears throat> so then, this discovery in the 70s um, uh, energized a lot of people uh, to try and figure out, OK, we build all these detectors from visible to radio to gamma rays. How can we build a detector to detect gravitational waves? And that became a many decade effort. Um, now, the way you might go about thinking of, about this question is to first ask yourself, OK, based on the theory, what is the effect of gravitational waves? Because if you don't understand the effect on your surroundings, then you have no, no way of figuring out how to detect it. So the key question is, what is their effect? And it turns out that when gravitational waves, and I don't know if I can do this with a mouse, when gravitational waves, let's say, travel perpendicular to this screen, as they travel through the screen, the geometry of the screen experiences the oscillation you see there in the plane, perpendicular to the propagation direction. So gravitational waves are stretching and squeezing reference point particles or uh, space in general in this cruciform manner. So it was this kind of oscillation that people started thinking about how to detect. Now, a major problem was that if you did the calculations Einstein did, uh, you concluded that these waves were extremely weak. By the time the waves came to us from any reasonable astrophysical source, they, the fractional changes in distance are minuscule. That's why we can't tell that we're being bombarded right now by gravitational waves that are going through us. Um, so if you wanted to figure out how much of a stretch does the Earth experience because of the, you know, a gravitational wave going by from the other side of the galaxy, for example, then you would find that the oscillation is as small as the size of a proton. Okay? You can't see that. So it was a huge challenge to understand how to build the detector. And I can't take any credit for that. I'm a theorist, as Vicky said. And the theorists in the collaboration are um, still at all uh, to our instrument scientists and engineers who figured out not only figured out how to do it, but actually did it. <clears throat> so the three people that are crucial in this story back in the 70s uh, are Ray Weiss, MIT professor, Ron Drieber, uh, all retired, uh, Caltech professor, Keith Thorne, also Caltech professor. What Ray, the story started really with Ray, who was affected and influenced by research that was done at the time mainly in Germany and in Russia. Uh, and I'll tell a mini story. Ray may say his story, but I can't resist telling this story when he comes later in the year. But Ray was a young assistant professor at MIT. His department chair came in and told him, next semester, I want you to teach general relativity. Ray knew nothing about general relativity but did not dare tell his department chair that he had never taken general relativity. So he spent his summer working, preparing for this class to teach it. And along the way, as, as a, a, a core experimentalist as he is, he was beating his head trying to figure out, how would I detect these damn waves? Do they really exist? So he came up with the full picture of how one might do this. Uh, and basically, it all boils down to laser interferometry. So you take a laser, and it's a very simple representation. I'll play the movie again. You take a laser, <coughs> you run it through a beam splitter, and you let it propagate down two right angles, and then you let the light come back, and you study it at an interference point. And the study of that interference pattern is telling you, basically, allows you to measure how long did it take for the two light beams, which travel with the speed of light, 
How long did it take them to go all the way to the end and come back? And from that time measurement effectively, you can figure out that actually these endpoints in this L-shaped detector are potentially being distorted in a very characteristic way by a gravitational wave that might be coming from the top and hence the oscillation happens in the plane. Okay? So that was the fundamental way. He had an accidental meeting with Keith Thorne um, uh, at a conference where Keith was making predictions about binary black holes and what kinds of waves, that, uh, how strong waves they might be uh, producing. And then eventually they partnered with Ron Driver, who was also a very talented experimentalist, and they started this project. They started LIGO. <clears throat> so eventually, decades later, we have two detectors, one in Louisiana, one in Washington State, and that's our first gravitational wave telescope. Now, on the scale of these detectors, the arms that you see here are actually four kilometers long. On the scale of these detectors, we're trying to measure a change in length that in math, in, in, in numerical terms, is 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, you might ask, how small is this? It's small, you can tell it's small, but the question, you know, do you get a feeling of how small? Well, start with one meter, <clears throat> divide by 10,000, you get a human hair width. You divide by another factor of 100, you get the wavelength of visible light. Another factor of 10,000, you become as big as an atom. Another factor of 100,000 smaller, you become as big as a nucleus. Then you divide by another factor of 1,000, and that's 10 to the minus 18 meters. <laughs> that's what you're trying to measure. So LIGO became a project, but it was not an easy thing to sell to anybody to fund it, okay? Uh, because you, you told any engineer or experimentalist at the time that you're going to measure this kind of change in space-time, and they look at you like you're ready for a psychiatric examination. <laughs> Ray says so. I wasn't there. Um, so... <clears throat> He started in the 70s, he taught that course in 1972, uh, coupled with Keith and Ron Driver, so MIT and Caltech suddenly started supporting their own faculty in this endeavor. Eventually, um, uh, a community process in physics endorsed the building of LIGO, the National Science Board in 1990, 20 years later, approved it as a project. We started construction in 90, uh, started construction 94, 95. I joined around 99, um, and then we started taking uh, data uh, in early uh, mid 2000s, and this is where we are now, September 2015. The collaboration I talked about got started much later. Got started in 1997, and then we worked together. Uh, bringing in the people we needed with the right expertise to work through all, all the challenges we were facing. So on that day, my slides are, oh, on that day, on September 14th, it was a Monday, <clears throat> at about 6 a.m. Eastern time, and the detectors were operating, but we were still not 100%, we were not yet calling it as, we're taking data, okay? We were keep telling ourselves we're testing things. At 6 a.m. Eastern Time, an automated email from a data analysis pipeline reached three people. It reached a person in Germany, Marco Drago. The names are here, and a person in Florida, and another person at MIT. The two in Florida and MIT were sleeping. The, the guy in Germany, looks at this email, clicks on that link, looks at the data, and realizes there's something weird in the data. I now, uh, in about an hour later, after he goes down his office to another postdoc, he's a postdoc, by the way, uh, and says, look, I'm seeing this in the data. What do you think? Does it look normal to you? What are we supposed to do now? <laughs> <laughs> so about an hour later, the first human sends an email to the collaboration 
and says there's a very interesting event in the last hour. 20 minutes later, somebody says there is no scheduled hardware injection. What this means is that up until then, we were doing tons of testing. We would inject fake signals in our data to check that we can actually recover them. So somebody went and checked and said there is no scheduled hardware injection for this time. Another person looks at it, says, very interesting indeed. Does it look like a high mass in spiral? Already, we could tell it was a chirp. 25 minutes later, the Omega scan, something that checks the status of the detector, have finished, and I don't see any detector quality issues at the time of this trigger. The data looks quite clean in both detectors. 15 minutes later, we have the first actual measurement of something. This is clean and very significant. In spiral, with a chirp mass of 27 plus or minus 2 solar masses. If this is not an injection, which everybody thought it was at that point, I guess we need to do the detection checklist. So we had come up with a list of 170 plus items that we were supposed to check if at any point we wanted to test the trigger against the possibility that it's an actual detection. I served on this detection, uh, not the checklist, I served on the committee that went uh, through all the items and collected all the information uh, and it took us many months to get convinced. <clears throat> now, I that day uh, went through my day uh, having one of these crazy days where I was going from one meeting to the next, barely having time to visit the restroom. You must have days like this. And all I could do was check on my phone as I was going from meeting to meeting that there were some weird emails, but I could never finish reading the full email or any email. All I could tell is that there's some commotion in the LIGO email list, but I'll look at it tonight. At about 6 p.m., I'm now at home. We're preparing dinner with my husband. Uh, we have small kids, and I get a text message on my phone from a graduate student of mine, an older graduate student of mine, who says, have you been keeping up with LSC, LIGO Scientific Collaboration Emails today? I say, not yet. What should I catch? About the gamma ray burst, I won't tell that story, or the loud trigger in ER8, this test collecting data period. The number of that trigger was G18, something I couldn't remember the full number. And he responds in a way that he never talks to me, of course. <laughs> well, trigger, baby. This could be the one. I was on most of the telegrams this morning. If you want an update, then we talk later on Skype. So I wasn't convinced that night. But uh, uh, about a month later, I started thinking maybe this is real. So there's our chirp. <clears throat> uh, we could tell that it was on the sky, but we couldn't pinpoint it on the sky. Uh, we could measure the distance, but we, couldn't, we had this big arc on, arc on the sky. The first time I gave a public lecture on this event and I showed this plot of the sky, somebody said, the sky is smiling at you. And boy, did it feel this way. Um, these are the data, the windows are the data. The thin line that you see there is actually the predictions from Einstein for how would the gravitational wave signal from this pair of black holes with the right masses would look like. Um, so you can see it's in uh, extraordinary good agreement for a minuscule measurement we're trying to make. Now we are a year later uh, and the detectors actually run from end of August until mid-January. Mid um, and we, well, the end of August was the testing, September 12 officially to January 19. And we have now had multiple detections, one from September, the one I've been talking about. Another one came in December. It actually came December 25th, local time, US time and Canada time. Uh, it was Christmas evening, right in the middle of everybody's family dinner. Or not everybody's, I'm sorry, but anyhow. Um, and uh, in the U.S. it's almost everybody, it's scary. Um, <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and it, it did destroy some family dinners because the, the, the members went on a telecom immediately and started looking at the data. And now we know it was another uh, pair of binary black hole. And then we had another signal in October, which is not as loud as we, we wanted for us to claim a detection, but it looks exactly like a binary black hole as well. <clears throat> so we have 2.8, we call them, candidates. We analyze the data. We can extract all kinds of information from these three events. I won't go through this plot, they're too complicated, but I just want to tell you that apart from pretty pictures, we actually do real calculations with the data. <laughs> um, uh, we can measure masses of the black holes. We can measure how far away they are. We can measure the final black hole mass and how fast it's spinning. And we can measure mass ratio and another measure of spins. So we are extracting information about the sources of these gravitational waves. And we're learning about black hole properties that we couldn't have figured out in the past. All three sources are pairs of black holes in loud death spirals. And if we compare these black hole masses that we measure compared to black hole masses from stars, not in centers of galaxies, that we have measured, they're actually heavy black holes, as we say. So this is the September event. The two black holes were 30 and 40 almost solar masses, and they formed the 60 solar mass black hole. And same for the other two events. The black hole masses down here are black hole mass measurements we have, have been able to make using X-ray observations. And clearly, we're now discovering black holes that look rather different and it has implications about their formation. So a fundamental question we would like to be eventually answering is how do black hole binaries actually form in nature? And I'll just give you a quick flavor of things. Two black holes in an orbit one around the other can form if you start with two stars in an orbit one around the other. When the stars lose their nuclear fuel, they collapse into black holes. If the binary survives, then you get this final in spiral of black holes. So we can study these. I've, I've spent many of my years trying to understand exactly these processes. Another way is to actually form the black holes independently from independent stars, but in a dense region. Then the black holes are heavy. They sink in the center of a cluster of stars that becomes a cluster of black holes. And they start kicking each other and interacting gravitationally, and stochastically, they can form binaries of black holes. Both of these formation mechanisms right now are still on the table. The current data with our three detections are not allowing us yet to exclude or favor one or the other. But this is a, a ma major question that's facing us. And hopefully, with more observations and detections, we'll get to the answer. So I want to also tell you that this is the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, it's also multi-messenger astronomy, because some of these binary mergers don't just emit gravitational waves, but they can also, if they involve not just two black holes, but if they involve also neutron stars that some of you may have heard about, they can emit also electromagnetic waves. And that means that we can have different types of messengers electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves combined together from the same source and try and uncover their uh, behavior. So down the road, in terms of what we look forward to, uh, more gravitational wave observatories will allow us to make that banana on the sky to make it a point. We need more detectors all around the Earth to be able to pinpoint where these things are happening, and then we can follow them also with electromagnetic telescopes. Vigo is the closest to being operational. Potentially in 2017, we'll join operations with LIGO. Uh, the Japanese are about two or three years from starting taking data. And LIGO India also is now an approved project, and it might take um, about five years until it becomes operational. So there's a lot to look forward to. Without top detectors, we cannot have top observations. Gravitational waves, just like electromagnetic waves, come in different wavelengths. So looking down the road, 
we are hoping to not just have LIGO detectors, but have space detectors in gravitational waves. And then we can use also radio telescopes indirectly to study gravitational waves, something I won't have time to describe, of course. So I'll finish with a thought. You know, this is all great. It sounds a little magical, maybe a little unreal. Black holes swirling billions of years away. Why shouldn't you care? Okay, so, well, one possibility might be because you want to become a gravity spy. That's a citizen science project. Just Google gravity spy and uh, you'll get to see what this is, but you can join the fun. <clears throat> Uh, another way is that, you know, apart from the fascination, all this detector technology has instigated, has changed our own lives. A lot of the medical imaging, a lot of uh, GPS uh, on our phones comes from general relativity and it's connected to understanding general relativity. But the thing that really motivates me on an everyday life when I don't think about the crazy black holes out there is that is the, the looks I get in my students' faces when they realize something like this, when they understand what we're talking about and how you can work through your math and understand the physics and, and, and actually predict something that then you can observe through this kind of an amazing experience. Thank you. happy to take questions. I know Vicky has to run to get her car to take me to dinner. <laughs> Go ahead. So when you being able to measure um, gravitational waves, like the uh, on the rhythm? <laughs> well, Yes, I will repeat the question. So by detecting gravitational waves, can we somehow postpone Armageddon? Well, different people might think different things when you say Armageddon. Um, but, you know, the short answer is not really. We, you know, if something like this is going to happen in nature, we can't really con control it. Uh, but the more we learn about nature, uh, the more we uh, know how to interact with it and how to best leverage what our knowledge for the benefit of ourselves and our society. Can we prevent Armageddon? Probably not if it ever happens. Thank you. Yes? Uh, you mentioned earlier in the slide that the gravitational waves, the collision with the right? And I was wondering, since gravitational waves aren't electromagnetic waves, how do they come to light? Yes, so they don't, and you're right. Um, so they, that, that kind of comparison is based on the following. You can count, remember I said gravitational waves carry energy, okay? And electromagnetic waves carry energy. It's different types of energy, but they're measured as the same quantity. So if you calculate all the energy in gravitational waves, the energy per unit, per second that was released in that final collision and then you say, okay, how much energy per second are all the stars in the whole universe emitting? Then, of course, they are emitting it in electromagnetic waves. The black holes are emitting it in gravitational waves. But in terms of how much energy per unit time, that's the kind of comparison we did, and it's 50 times brighter. Now, there's a big difference, I should say. You know, maybe we're, we're pushing our, def not definitions, but the comparison is not fair in some way because the binary black, black holes produce that kind of energy in, um, half, you know, half a second uh, while the stars are shining for billions of years with the same kind of energy per unit per second. So eventually, of course, they need a lot more energy from the two black holes. Yes? Measure something like such a 
Yes, this, this is a very good question. I mean, we've spent, we've spent decades of our lives, we collectively, um, uh, trying to address exactly this problem. And a detector that can be sensitive enough to an astrophysical source, uh, it can only do it if we understand all the noise sources. So these LIGO detectors, and there are many noise sources. I can tell you that a truck driving by uh, one of these L-shaped detectors makes the end points shake. Um, if an airplane flying, logging in Louisiana, there's a lot of logging. Every time a, a, a tree trunk falls down, the detector is shaking. So there are there, there's two ways uh, we're doing this. So one is each detector has, um, I think it's about. 400,000 external monitors that sense all kinds of other things in connection to the detector, the electronics, and the surroundings. So earthquakes, any other motion, earth-based, is being monitored. If it's an astrophysical source, then those monitors should be quiet. If it's an earth-based source, then you see the signal in all those other, not all of them, but in some other monitors. Uh, so in this case, for example, we kept check, you know, we checked all the environmental monitors, as we call them. The other thing is that this is exactly why we need two detectors. We could not have made this detection. You might say, why did you build two? Okay, because we have extra money and we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, so you couldn't make this claim or be trusting that you see an astrophysical source without having two. Uh, if it's an astrophysical source, then the signal, depending on where it is, has to appear on both detectors with the right time delay. And we can measure time very accurately. And we know the speed of light. And we know what time delays that should be. Any artificial Earth-based uh, noise source, uh, it, it's extremely unlikely, although not impossible, um, to be correlated in the two detectors in the right way. Uh, so that cuts a lot of the noise because it happens on one arm detector but not the other. Uh, another way we do it is we actually we 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 have we we look for a certain signal um, to have this chirp-like behavior. Many other noise sources, earth ter terrestrial sources, they don't have a chirp-like behavior. They're a shape, but they're not a shape with that characteristic. So there's a lot, of, and then we do a, a few things with data analysis that allows us to, to dig into the noise, as we say. Uh, so it, it's a valid question, and this is partly why it took us months to announce it, because we were checking exactly all of these things. Yes? So the two colliding uh, black holes are being much closer. Will they have a bigger signal? Yeah, yes, so our signal does depend on the distance. Uh, what we measure, but it's, it's not exactly the same as uh, electromagnetic waves. With electromagnetic detectors, we, um, we gain by the distance squared. So if something is twice closer, then we receive uh, uh, four times more energy. With, gravita with gravitational waves, um, the signal, we measure amplitude, not energy, and it depends on one over distance. So twice closer makes the amplitude twice higher. But yes, it would be a stronger signal the closer it is. The trouble is that these events are not common. If they were very common, then you might see one really close by. It's an easy measurement to make in comparison. But uh, they're so rare that you, most of them are coming from far away, statistically speaking. And I keep forgetting to repeat the question, but I'll try to remember. Yes. Uh, so, do you think that the comparison of the models with the filter data does not really ensure that that the model really represents the phenomenon? Is there any other model that would predict some this kind of signal? Yeah. So again, the, this is an important question that that we had to address. So, we, in this respect, we were kind of like. So I, 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 let me repeat the question. Um, I mentioned that we we look for this chirp signal, okay, in the data, uh, and I think your question is, you know, what if the 
I'm trying to paraphrase correctly, but what if, um, you know, there is no other model that can give you this kind of signal. So uh, there are two things there. One is that indeed, in physics, there is nothing else that anybody has ever predicted that produces this kind of signal uh, that is consistent with Einstein's prediction. But more importantly, we were kind of lucky with this first uh, signal because in order to find it in the data, we did not have to look for a chirp. This was such a loud signal that even an, what we call an unmodeled search, we just said, I'm just looking for excess power, excess activity in my data without looking for the characteristic chirp signal. Found it. That first automated email was the burst pipeline, not the in spiral pipeline. And, and basically, it found it as a little bump in, in the data. Uh, but then, of course, we dug into with chirp. So, um, so we, we really have, uh, we're certain that it's not because we're looking for that signal that we found it. Yes. Did astronomers try pointing telescopes? Yes, yes. And and they found well, okay. So we had uh, this not knowing what we're gonna find. We had private agreements, well, public agreements. Uh, I'm looking at Daryl Haggard, who has an agreement like this with the LIGO collaboration. But we had uh, individual agreements with groups of electromagnetic observers, and we said if we see something that is exceed certain thresholds, you know, it's improbable by that level, uh, then we'll notify you and we'll tell you what we know. When we saw it, where it was on the sky, with the man, um, and whatever else we know quickly. And there were uh, tons of groups, I think uh, close to 60 groups, that went looking in electromagnetic waves. Everybody has reported an upper limit, except in gamma rays there is a team that has said, we have found something that we cannot explain with anything else. It's associated in time, but you know the, the sky location is so big, it's not clear. Some people are debating, it's a debate in the community whether that gamma ray signal is associated with our binary black holes or not. So I'd say this is still an open question. If we have neutron star, which has actual matter and it's not a singularity, uh, then we do expect naturally in the community ways and people will be looking for those. Let's just take maybe two more questions. Yes. Um, if basically here you're looking for three binaries there, uh, is it that you're looking for binaries there because the sound is just so loud? No, so so it's a, it's not a whole year, it's four months, and we detected three. The detectors are not running now. Uh, the instrument scientists are trying to make them uh, strong, uh, more sensitive. So the question is, uh, we found these three signals in, in our observing run. Is it because um, uh, we're looking for this type of signal, the chirp, or is it because that's the only thing that happens out there and it's loud enough for us to see? So the answer is that uh, the lack. So right now, given the sensitivity of the instrument, this is the only type of signal we have been able to find in the data uh, and have a detection. Uh, we haven't seen anything else that is inconsistent with noise. Uh, basically, everything else, any other disturbance we have seen in the data looks like noise. So uh, we'll see if we find other types of signals. But for now, it's binary black holes. Um, here. I don't know how to choose. Yes, <laughs> I see too many hands. Like a detector, you were measuring the distortion in space, and how do you compute the distortion in time of the gravitational wave? Yeah, so what happens is that the distortion in time, this actually has been checked, and there is a question of whether we can use the di distortion in time and detect the gravitational waves, but it's actually below the um, uh, below the sensitivity of our best clocks right now. So it cannot be done at least, not now, not at these frequencies. Uh, so we are measuring really the displacement of the mirrors at the end points of this L shape. I don't know who has, I can take maybe. Okay. You want to take one more? You're, one the, more. you're the speaker, one more. one more, if you're feeling. Yes. 
I know I, I haven't looked. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I have neglected my left there and right hand. Yes. You're focusing on increasing the detection limit of the, the, the future LIGO like experiment. Would they be overwhelmed if we had like a couple of supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies combined? Would we just overwhelm them and blow them all? So actually, uh, thankfully no. And the reason is, I mean, you're right to think that you know supermassive black holes are billion solar mass black holes, not 30 and 40, uh, and therefore the signal might be much uh, stronger, and it will be much stronger but it comes at their own frequency. And that's why multi-wavelength astronomy is important. So if I go to, uh, <coughs> there. So supermassive black holes are emitting strong gravitational waves, but they are coming in time scales, periods of the waves that are minutes to hours or years to decades. And our LIGO detectors are only sensitive to millisecond signals. This is equivalent to having a, a telescope like Galileo had, a visible light telescope, and asking, can I detect an X-ray source? Okay? And the answer is no, it could be very bright in X-rays, but if your detector only sees visible light, then you'll never see it. So that's that the value of having different types of detectors to detect all the different wavelengths. We're going to make one more exception for somebody who's not only on the left, but that has shorter arms. So there's um, a young person up there who had a question. Hi there. Yes. <laughs> you have to really holler for us to hear you down there. How far is it from Earth? How far is these black holes that we have detected colliding? They are uh, they are that far away that the wave took more than a billion years to travel from the black holes to our detectors. Okay, so it travels with the speed of light, uh, and that's a very high speed that nothing around us moves that fast. And yet, it took more than a billion years. So it's really, really far away. Uh, not inside our galaxy, far away. It entered our galaxy, the, sign the, the signal, the disturbance entered our galaxy 50,000 years ago. It started much further away. OK? OK. Um, so just quickly. <laughs> Really make you all clap again. Um, but before everybody leaves the room, I just want to let you know, and Vicki was kind enough to mention this a few times during her talk, but Ray Weiss, who she mentioned several times, is one of the forefathers of this whole entire field of gravitational wave astronomy and one of the designers of the LIGO experiment, um, is coming here to McGill to give a talk in March of 2017. So he'll be here, I'm not sure if the lecture will be on the 9th or the 10th, but if you care a lot about gravitational wave astronomy and you want to put that on your calendar, March 9th or 10th, 2017. Um, and so now you have to clap again. Thank you. <laughs>